السلام عليكم يا مصطفى خير كان توكن عربي ولا انجلش ولا زي انجلش باتر اوكي انجلش باتر سو توداي ويل بي توكينج اباوت ذا امريكان كولج اوف كارديولوجي 2021 جايدلاينز فور ايفالويشن اند دايجنوز اوف تشيست بين اي ام سامح القفاص ام ان اسيستنت بروفيسور اوف كارديولوجي هير ان كاي يونيفرستي اند ذس برزنتيشن واز دان ويز ذا Uh, very good help from my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ahmed Meher. Um, talking about guidelines is actually is a very easy task because at the end of the day, these are guidelines and it's a very hard task to present, to do a presentation because if you know the presentation skills, we have to do something that is interesting and engaging and guidelines by default are not interesting or engaging. They are basically guidelines. They give you algorithms, They give you what to do in certain situations. They actually are not meant for studying or yeah, they are guidelines. You have to look at them and to know what to do in a specific situation. So they give you guidelines as they say. Uh, evaluation diagnosis of chest pain, uh, what changed in 2021 are just a few things. Uh, this is the cover of uh, the AHA ACC clinical practice guideline, evaluation and diagnosis of chest pain. Uh, to understand that this particular guidelines, there are two pieces of information. One is general for any guideline, which is basically the aim, which is written in small print at the end of the slide. Clinical practice guideline for diagnosis and evaluation of chest pain provides recommendations and algorithms for clinicians to assess and diagnose chest pain with other patients. So this is the aim of a guideline to give you a recommendation algorithm what to do in evaluating a chest pain in an other patient. The second part is part of the change that happened in this guideline is because of the chair of the, uh, uh, of the writing committee, Dr. Marta Gulati, because interestingly, um, this is a new one in, in the American guidelines. American guidelines are notorious for being, I will not say dull, but they are usually to the point. They give you algorithms. This is one of the first time that we see something as colorful and uh, looking nice like this, because uh, they are trying to summarize what is new in these guidelines, and they summarized it in the words chest pains, so you can remember it. Uh, every one of these letters is a synonym for what to do. For example, chest pain is chest pain means more than pain in just that, and, and so on. We'll go through this rapidly. If you really look into this, in my humble opinion, these are just a nice way to present three simple facts. And this is what is really new, a lot new, what has changed in the guidelines. First of all, the emphasis that there are atypical presentation and they remove the word atypical. They mean that there are certain populations that present with chest pain-like symptoms that has to be put in mind that this can be ischemic coronary artery disease presentation. That's the first point. Chest pain is not just chest pain, it is something more. The second point is when you evaluate chest pain, what to do? The algorithms and the clinical decision pathways, the CDPs, the Americans like to use abbreviations. So what to do in this? And the third point is giving priority to the patient himself. You, You would see, for example, the S here is share the decision-making, share the patient in the process and educate the patient, educate the general public. So these algorithms not only is 
telling the physicians what to do, but basically also telling them to engage the patients in the decision-making process and giving you algorithms how to deal with that. This is partly because the head of the writing committee or the chair is Dr. Martha Bulati. She is an author of different books. One of the most uh, famous of her books is Saving Women's Heart. She is very interested in women's heart health and she has publications, she has a website, she's an author, she has a Twitter channel, she is out there. And that's why that explains the new way of presenting the data in this particular guidelines. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's really nice, but we are, uh, <laughs> we are studiers by, by profession. We like to study, we like to summarize things. So I'll try to help with that. So what they are trying to say here in chest pains, I'd like to summarize in the three important points that I started my presentation with. First, chest pain itself. The C is chest pain is much more than just chest pain. What they do, what they do mean here is not only we are evaluating chest pain, we are evaluating symptoms suggestive of cardiac or coronary heart disease. So certain populations like women or elderly or diabetics may have different presentation than chest pain, for example, dyspnea or uh, disturbed conscious level, and you have to put them in these algorithms. The title says evaluation and assessment of chest pain, but this can encompass much more than chest pain. Any symptoms that can be thought coming from a cardiac problem. The second part is accompanying, accompanying, accompanying symptoms that and again, women may be more likely to present with accompanying symptoms like dyspnea, like dizziness, like epigastric pain and vomiting. So again, you hear see the highlight about women, that women definitely you have to, I would say to suspect coronary heart disease, you have low threshold of suspicion because they may present with atypical and the word atypical is not there anymore as we'll see now, or accompanying symptoms more than the chest pain itself. The last thing in the chest pain evaluation itself, the word non-cardiac. They do not use anymore, as we used to say before, typical angina or atypical angina. This is no more. It is cardiac, probably cardiac or non-cardiac. And I totally agree with this because the term, if you use atypical chest pain, what they really meant, it is not going in cardiac pathway of chest pain. But when I hear the word atypical chest pain, what comes into my mind, it is atypical presentation. So that confusion is not here anymore. The guidelines say we are not allowed to use the term atypical. It is either cardiac, probably cardiac, or if you are not having any suspicion that this is cardiac, you call it non-cardiac chest pain. Okay, so this is nomenclature, but it is important to clear this one up. The second thing is, engagement of the patient, early care. You have to educate the public that whenever you have something that is not really normal in the chest area, whether chest pain or dyspnea or any accompanying symptoms, you have to seek medical help. And this is for the public. This is one that is here. Number two, share the decision-making. When the patient presents to the ER and you are doing the test and doing anything, you have to share the algorithm and the strategy with the patient so that he understands or she understands what's really going on. For example, a patient coming with epigastric pain and vomiting has to understand why we are doing an ECG and the cardiac troponin. And on the other way around, a patient may be rushed into the cath lab or a patient has been told, no, you have to follow up in the outpatient departments, share the decision-making with the patient. And... An important point that the patient has to understand that testing is not routinely needed in low-risk patients. Not any patient coming with chest pain in the ER has to be tested fully for the cardiac problems. That's another message that has to be done. So the decision is there, we are using an algorithm, and this is a big part of what's happening in the United States because part of the guidelines, definitely a medical point of view, but another part is a medical legal and the standardization of the procedure what to do in a certain situation. So you are following the guidelines, you are following the algorithm. Algorithms are not 100% foolproof, but again, they are good. They give you a guideline. 
again, the clinical sense has to be there. Sometimes you have that deep feeling that this patient is cardiac, even if the ECG and the cardiac troponin is not that really convincing. But again, you have to trust your clinical sense and you have to follow the algorithm of the guidelines as much as you can. The rest, the age, the high sensitivity cardiac troponin, the clinical pathway, clinical decision pathway, the CDPs, identify patients most likely to, to benefit. Again, how to do patient selection and structured risk assessment are again are just the same thing. You have to use the algorithm and the CDP, the clinical decision pathway, to decide to categorize this patient and to know what to do with this patient. Will you go for further testing? Will you go for directly for the invasive coronary angio or send him home to follow up in the outpatient clinic? So chest pains, this beautiful illustration of what to do is basically three things. First thing, chest pain is not just chest pain. Accompanying symptoms can be the symptoms, presenting symptoms, particularly in women, and non-cardiac is in, atypical is out. The patient has to be engaged. The general public has to know that you have to seek medical advice as early as possible, and you have to share the decision-making with them, and they have to know that not any chest pain in the ER deserve further testing. And the rest is ours, that we need you to use high sensitivity cardiac troponins. We have to put the patient in the algorithm and the clinical decision pathway. And finally, the structured risk assessment must be used in all patients. Okay? And we are almost done. <laughs> because the rest of the presentation is actually the guidelines. And the guidelines at the end of the day are algorithms to follow in a particular patient. So it will be, in my humble opinion, we, are, we will not be wasting our times, but it's much easier for each of us to look into the algorithm. But I will try to highlight the important points and the difference in this. So the description of chest pain, again, what we'll start with, it is not just pain in the chest. It can be in the shoulder, jaw, neck, epigastric area, or back. We all know this and should not be described as typical or atypical. We said we have cardiac, probably cardiac or non-cardiac, and this is a class one indication. If you don't do this, it's a problem. It's a class one indication. And this, it's a very nice graph showing what is the probability of ischemia according to the character of the chest pain and the differential diagnosis of chest pain that we have. Interestingly, let's start with this. We all know this. You can immediately tell from what is the patient or how the patient is describing his chest pain, what's going on. Is the probability of ischemia high or low? We won't go through details. A very important point in the differential diagnosis is this. It's a potential life-threatening and common non-life-threatening. And this is very nice. They are very nicely put. Again, I'll not go into details. We all know that the life-threatening are the coronary syndromes, the pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, tension, pneumothorax. These are very important and life-threatening. And the non-life-threatening, major gastrointestinal chest infections and chest wall syndromes, musculoskeletal pain, and so on. But the nice thing that they put here is the word common. There is a graph I did not put in the presentation, but it says it all. They describe according to the age category, the causes of the chest pain in the ER. More than 50% of chest pain cases in the ER are non-specific, are the common non-life threatening, okay? All the rest, acute coronary syndromes, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, each one of them is definitely less than seven or 8% of the presenting case. So what is common is common. We are in the ER, we we'll meet 100 patients with chest pain. More than 50% of these patients would have non-specific cause for the chest pain. There will be low risk. And the 45% or 40% will have different causes of these categories, different causes. So what is common is common. And again, our role in the ER is to exclude the presence of potentially life-threatening causes. This is the mindset that we should have in the emergency room. Other patient-focused considerations that women may uh, are at risk for underdiagnosis and potential cardiac cause should always be suspected even if the presentation is not really typical. And again, the elderly 
when associate the symptoms because we see this in the elderly a lot this near delirium or syncope sometimes this may be the initial presentation of an acute coronary syndrome we have to do a focused cardiovascular examination ECG definite class one indication unless there is a very obvious non-cardiac cause and the chest x-ray definitely helps in exclusion of other causes and this is the algorithm of acute chest pain algorithms alg algorithms are coming so bear with me so we have acute chest pain we have history and physical examination you do the ECG a potential cardiac cause so there is no cardiac causes from the history the examination the ECG evaluate for non-cardiac causes a STEMI follow the STEMI guideline no so again we have suspicion from the history of physical examination the ECG is neutral then we have to exclude the life threatening causes of acute coronary syndrome acute aortic syndrome pulmonary embolism acute myopericarditis and valvular heart disease these are this is a very important point the place of the cardiac biomarkers and the cardiac biomarkers nowadays are mainly cardiac troponin and if possible high sensitivity cardiac troponin because this really simplifies the algorithm as i've just said more than 50 percent of the cases will have non-specific causes of chest pain so a good role is we have a tool that can exclude the cause of cardiac or exclude that there is a major life-threatening problem in the first hour and we do have that with the cardiac troponin especially if the chest pain onset is more than three hours before presentation and that is usually the case in our countries. The patient had pain and he's waiting it for to go away and it doesn't go away for two or three hours, then he presents to the ER. In this particular patient, a history, clinical examination, an ECG, and a high sensitivity cardiac troponin is all what you need. So you can do that. If all are negative, then you can send the patient home. High sensitivity cardiac troponin, the third box here, is the preferred biomarker enables more rapid detection or exclusion of myocardial injury and increases diagnostic accuracy if it's a class one. And you should be familiar with the analytical performance and the 99 percentile upper reference limit that defines the cardiac troponin assay in your institution. And this differs from different assays, different between institutions, and they encourage institutions to adopt their own algorithm and their own pathways. The clinical decision pathways, the TDPs. So a patient with acute chest pain, or acute coronary syndrome, acute chest pain. This is basically what we start with. Again, history, physical examination, ECG, obvious non-cardiac cause, non-cardiac testing. You go that way on the right side, possible acute coronary syndrome from the history, the examination, the ECG, obtain troponin and use the CDP, and we'll see that now. CDP. Clinical decision pathway will give you one of three results. Either you have a low risk patient, no testing required, discharge. Okay. Intermediate risk, further diagnostic testing, high risk invasive coronary angiography. This is basic and it's very easy to do. But the problem is when you have this, is again, we are doing the, the, the emphasis on this. Normal ECG, symptoms suggestive of acute coronary syndrome at least three hours before emergency department arrival. A single high sensitivity cardiac troponin below the limit of detection is reasonable to exclude myocardial injury. We are done. And again, you should implement a CDP in your institution that provides a protocol when and how to use the CTN, the cardiac troponin sample. These are the clinical decision pathways. There are a lot of pathways. Uh, they are basically the same. Basically, there are three things to look at. First, the typicality of chest pain. How do you characterize the chest pain? The risk factors of the patient, the atherosclerotic risk factor, the age, the presence of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, family history, and so on. And the ECG, and some of these put on the cardiac troponin. For example, the heart pathway. Our pathway is history, ECG, age, risk factors, and troponin. Each of this, according to the result or the range, is given a score, a number, 0, 1, 2. You add the score of the patient, and you get a low risk if you have a heart score of less than 3, intermediate risk from 4 to 6, high risk from 7 to 10. For example, this is one example of the clinical decision pathway. 
there are many more. And it doesn't really matter. They are basically revolve around the same idea. But for example, if you adopt the heart pathway and what to do in this patient. So again, I have a patient with acute chest pain. I do history, clinical examination, and ECG, and put this data in the clinical decision pathway, and I get a number, a score. This number will tell me that patient is low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. If you go back to the algorithm, high risk, we go to an invasive coronary angio, low risk, discharge home, the intermediate risk is the problem. What to do that? So the low risk, no evidence that stress testing or cardiac imaging within 30 days of index emergency department visit improves outcomes. So that is the basis why a patient with low risk in the clinical decision pathway can be sent home without further testing. This is a change from the previous guidelines where stress testing within 72 hours was basically recommended for all. Even a low risk patient, you discharge and you write that you need to do a stress test within the coming three days. This is not here anymore. If you do proper assessment, you go into a clinical decision pathway with an ECG and cardiac troponin and all came out okay, you can discharge the patient home. But again, this patient still have baseline cardiac risk factors. If hypertensive diabetic patients, we have to inform them that you have to control your hypertension and diabetes to decrease your future risk of coronary events. So these are the low risk patients. Intermediate risk patients, it basically revolves around, did they do prior testing or not for coronary heart disease in the past or not? So a patient coming to the ER, acute chest pain, history, physical examination, ECG, cardiac troponin, we have an intermediate risk score in the clinical decision pathway, for example, the heart pathway. We have to ask the patient, did you do any prior testing for the heart or not? And according to this, the algorithms are getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> so we have a lot to do, but basically it is very logic. A patient, let's do that. Well, prior testing, I don't know if we can. Oh, okay, we did that. So let's go. Uh, this is the part of the no. This is the right side of the algorithm. Okay, if the patient did not have any prior testing, I did not do anything before. So we can go to both a stress test or a coronary CT angiogram. These are the two arms. And these in this particular situation are both class one. We'll talk directly about when to choose or what to choose. So if you have inconclusive or moderate ischemia or severe ischemia in the stress test, then go for invasive coronary angio. Pretty basic. A patient coming, the clinical decision pathway told us that he's intermediate risk. We do a stress test. The stress test came positive with moderate or severe ischemia. We go to the invasive coronary angio. But if it's inconclusive, you can go also again to a CT coronary angio. CT coronary angio will give you either, this is not obstructive, discharge, it is that sensitive, the beauty of coronary CT angiogram is that it is a very good exclusion test. The negative predictive value approaches 100%. So when it is negative, it is probably negative. So if the patient with non-obstructive lesions on a coronary CT angio, provided it's a good quality test and that the expertise is there to do the test right, then you can discharge more. If the patient have inconclusive or obstructive coronary artery disease, if they have high risk coronary artery disease, high risk meaning left main or multi vessel disease in the CT angio, then go for invasive coronary angio. If you are still at doubt, we can go for an FFRCT, a new technology that uses computation to derive a FFR number from the CT. This is not an invasive coronary angio, this is from the CT that can further help. It is quite expensive and not readily available everywhere. So again, the decision to treat medically is there. If you deem, for example, a patient went for a CT angio and they have a diagonal lesion that is 70%. Okay, you can go for medical treatment and that's it. This is not life-threatening. We know the cause of the chest pain and you can go with guideline med uh, mediated therapy. So what to choose? See coronary CT angio versus stress energy. Both are class one in this situation. A patient with no prior testing, 
this table shows you what favors the use. What is really important about coronary CT angio, it is to rule out if the suspicion is a little bit on the low side because it's a very good exclusion test. You can tell the patient it is a non-obstructive coronary artery disease. But they have to have high quality imaging and expert interpretation. And the likelihood is actually better if you do it for younger patients. The reason behind this is with older age, you get more calcium in the coronaries and calcium is the enemy of coronary CT angio. Calcium is very difficult to interpret in coronary CT. That's why it is much better to use it in the less elderly patient, the less than 65 years. And it is definitely, if you are suspecting an anomalous coronary angio and require evaluation of the aorta or pulmonary, it can help. It can give you much more data than any other imaging modality. On the other hand, when to do stress testing, stress testing is very important to quantify ischemia. It doesn't show the coronaries, it shows you is there ischemia or not. For example, our 70% lesion in a small diagonal probably will not show up, show up in a stress test. So it tells you the amount of ischemia that is there. So this is anatomy and this is function. This is the anatomy of the coronary artery, the CT coronary angio, and the stress testing telling about the function of the coronary arteries, which is, is there is ischemia or not. And you can use it if a prior CT coronary angio is inconclusive and the other way around. If uh, non uh, stress test is inconclusive, you can go to CT CT angio. So they are complementary, not competitive. You can use both. You can decide to go one way and that one way is not conclusive. Then you go to the other way, stress test or CT angio. And it is important if the patient has a long history of ischemia because it can tell you a very important thing, which is, is there viability or not? Is there scar or not? So basically, CT coronary angio is a very good test if a patient is young and the probability is not really that high because it's a very good exclusion test and you can use it to discharge the patient. Stress testing is more suitable if the patient is older. If you have a previous inconclusive test, then you go for a stress test than a CT angio. Type the other part of the algorithm. If the patient had a prior test, the warranty period. What we call, mean by a warranty period? If a patient had a previous stress test during the past year that was good, that was negative, and the patient is coming now with acute chest pain that is intermediate, so probably it is okay. You no need for further testing. This extends to two years for an invasive coronary angio or a coronary CT angio in the past two years. So again, that can help if there is a prior test, the patient is coming now with chest pain, the clinical decision pathway tells us it is intermediate risk, and he had a coronary angio six months ago that was okay, then you can tell that it is probably be okay. Nothing more will happen. Again, what to do? Here, as you see, recent negative tests, as we have said, discharge. Prior inconclusive or mildly abnormal, do a CT coronary angio. It again can go both ways, non-obstructed discharge, inconclusive, do an FFRCT or an invasive coronary angio, or there is progression. So go ahead and do an invasive coronary angio. If the patient had a prior test within the last year or two years for invasive coronary angio that was moderate to severe, for example, he did a coronary angio one year ago with a lesion of 60 to 70% in the mid-right coronary and is coming with acute chest pain, Definitely, this can be progression and go directly for an invasive coronary angiogram. So again, this is the algorithm. Okay, somebody entered the waiting room. Admit. Type. Uh, acute chest pain, intermediate risk, and the patient is known to have coronary artery disease, not obstructed by CT, the, the previous test. You do a coronary CT angiogram, and you go in its pathway. If it is obstructive coronary artery disease, whether high risk or not, you can do stress testing. And again, the further testing here is class 2A, not class 1. So to summarize, I know algorithms are difficult to show like this. Algorithms, again, are meant to go through them with a particular patient in mind. You do not, sum, you do not memorize an algorithm. 
An algorithm is I have a patient who is tuck, 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 and this patient is intermediate risk according to my clinical decision pathway. And this patient had a prior test. So I go to this arm and I follow till I reach a decision. This is how you use algorithms. But to summarize, when to send the patient to invasive coronary angio, if there is high risk coronary artery disease, if you do a CT coronary angio and you have a left main for the 50% or three vessel disease, frequent angina, the patient's coming with frequent angina, a stress test having a new moderate to severe ischemia, the troponin is high, new reduced stab ventricular ejection fraction, definitely if there is hemodynamically unstable and if the patient to start with have a high risk score, for example, the heart score seven to 10. Moderate to severe ischemia, if, if F of RCT, you, de, you do a CT angio and you have a moderate to severe lesion, you do an F of RCT and it comes out uh, actually less than 0 0.8, or you do a stressed nuclear and it comes out having more than 10% of ischemic myocardium. And again, stress echo more than three segments, CMR more than 12% and so on. So basically this is one to do uh, according to the results of further testing that you ordered, when to go for an invasive coronary edge. So the other side, patient with stable chest pain, patient who comes with chest pain on effort or in, on inspiration or something like this. This is again what we call the risk stratification, the pretest probability. You can order tests, further testing for these patients, but what you like to do again is you determine the typicality of chest pain, and according to the age of the patient, you see what the pretest probability. What do we really mean by pretest probability? How do you define pretest probability? In دي نقط برافو عليك انت فاهم القصه يا شيخ بالظبط بس فاهم ولا هي لا لا انت بتشرحها كويس بس هقولها لكم ببساطه هي كانت مكتوبه لطيفه جدا في الجايد لاينز كده بيقول لك ذا داون ستريم كوست اوف اوردرنج ا تيست يعني ايه؟ انا النهارده في الكلينيكال ديسيجن باث واي وشفت العيان وعملت اسسمنت وعملت كذا كذا وعملت الاي سي جي وكذا وانا قررت اطلب ستريس اي سي جي ذير از ا داون ستريم كوست الكوست ده ممكن يكون كوست فلوس انت كلفت العيان او شركه التامين او التامين الصحي فلوس والكوست از ذا فولس ريزلت ذات كان كام اوت اوف ذا تيست ذات كان سند ذا بيشنت ان ا ديفرنت باث واي بوزيتيف اور نيجاتيف فانت اف يو اوردر ا تيست ذات از نوت ريلي سوتبل فور ذات بارتيكولار بيشنت يو جيت ا هاير لايكليهود اوف فولس ريزلتس وبالتالي ذيس فولس ريزلت will not only be false, it will guide the patient into a pathway that is pretty costly. Either way, for example, a patient, for example, a 35 year old lady that is coming complaining of burning chest pain and you ordered a stress ECG. A stress ECG has very low sensitivity and specificity in that particular subset of patients. So it came out positive. And you go for an invasive coronary angio which is costly and it can be complicated, for example, by loss of the radial artery or a femoral hematoma or a dissection. And that causes a lot of costs in the patient journey. On the other hand, a patient that you did a clinical decision pathway, a 60 year old male patient who is a smoker, diabetic and hypertensive, and uh, you ordered a CT coronary angiogram and he came out calcium score of 800. And you inject the contrast. And after the contrast, his baseline creatinine rose to three. So again, there is an important point here. This patient is actually not the type of patient that would like to use contrast in him. And he's above the age of 60 and he had high calcium score. So this patient is particularly will not benefit from that particular test and you can go into a different pathway because you ordered a particular test. So this is basically what's here. The pretest probability is telling you, are we suspecting ischemia? Are we suspecting coronary artery disease highly or not? If not that high, then you choose the test that is appropriate for this patient. This is basic. So according to pretest probability, the low risk, no further testing. If 
the selected cases you can do coronary artery calcium. This is a non-contrast based CT examination or a stress ECG. And if the patient is intermediate or high, then you can be justified to order a more specific test that is more costly and uses more invasiveness in the term of radiation exposure or contrast material exposure. Intermediate high or high risk patient was not known. You go for a CT coronary angio or stress testing. This is the importance of doing a pretest probability. You can tell the low pretest probability. This is not probably ischemia. You can discharge or do a simple test that is not giving the patient any contrast material or radiation, like a stress test or a coronary artery calcium. If it is intermediate or high risk, high pretest probability, then you go for a CT coronary angio or a stress test. Exercise ECG is a class 2A because of its low sensitivity and specificity. And an invasive coronary angio, again, is recommended if the results of this come out of high-risk coronary artery disease by CT coronary angio, F of RCT less than 0.8 or moderate to severe ischemia and so forth. So again, it is the same mindset. We need, remember chest pains, the clinical decision pathways are important. You have to use structured risk assessment protocol that you have to evaluate and categorize the patient. And according to the category of the patient, you decide what to do next. This can be discharge, this can be invasive coronary angio, or the in intermediate pretest probability in stable patient, or intermediate result of a clinical decision pathway in acute chest pain patient, you go for stress testing or CT coronary angio. Okay, uh, details. If a patient with a previous test that having non-obstructive or obstructive patient, if he had a previous test that was obstructive, you go for invasive coronary angio directly, or you can use to select the revascularization method in class 2A if the patient had a previous stress test, for example. If the patient is non-obstructive, you go for any of both. But again, in my opinion, in this particular patient, it is better to go for a stress test because you know that the patient already has coronary artery disease. And the question now is, is it obstructive or not? Is there ischemia or not? And this is not really what you get from a CT coronary angio. This you get from a stress test, more of a stress test. And finally, particular patients, post cabbage patient, see, Coronary CT angio is very uh, nice in this, nice for us, not for the patient. Because uh, when you do, any of you have been in the cath lab doing a coronary angio for a patient with previous cabbage, it is actually time consuming and contrast consuming and radiation consuming technique because you're starting to fish for the, the, the coronary artery bypass grafts, especially the aortic coronary ones. So it's very nice to do a CT coronary angio. You see the grafts, if they are open or not, and where are the grafts directly originating so it can be targeted. The problem with that approach is that the patient can be having the chest pain because of progression of the disease in his native coronary arteries. And by default, these patients who did a previous cabbage are long-term coronary artery disease patient. So the probability of high calcium is there, and high calcium means the ability of coronary CT angio to diagnose is actually less. So again, it's not really the best test to do in this way. Again, in this particular patient, sometimes I go for a stress test more because again, we are looking for ischemia. Is there ischemia now or not? Um, Transthoracic echo definitely is there. We, for, if you have noticed, not anywhere in the algorithm, we had an echocardiogram. We had history, we had clinical examination, we had ECG, even chest X-ray, cardiac troponin, cardiac biomarkers, CT coronary angio, stress testing, but there is no echo there. But echo definitely is recommended to exclude other potential life-threatening, non-ischemic causes as pericardial effusion, endocarditis, valvular heart disease, or myocarditis. And maybe we are going to talk about the same thing in the conference. دكتور هشام كان بيقول نفس القصه اللي ممكن تلاقي والدكتور وفاء كان بتتكلم ان في احيان كتير نعمل ايكو ما فيش جنرال موشن ابدوماليتيز ذس داز نوت بروف اني ثينج ان ا بيشنت وذ اكيوت تشست بين ان استني بيشنت ات از بروبلي ذير بات اجين يو هاف ذا دايجنوزيس فروم ذا اي سي جي 
you're not waiting for an echo to diagnose a STEMI. In a patient with acute chest pain, whether unstable angina or even non-STEMI, you, sometimes you cannot really appreciate the significant regional motion abnormalities in the echocardiogram. And CT angiography is recommended in aortic dissection. Definitely, this is a class one. Trans uh, echo or CMR is recommended if CT is, is contraindicated. I'm uh, CT CT with you know this. So, the question you ask about the patient in the عنده chest pain واحنا شاكين قصه التريب رول اوت. ايه تريب رول اوت؟ از دوينج ا سي تي انجيوجرام ذات جيفنج ذا كونتراست ان ا سيرتن واي ان ا كونسنتريشن ذات ات اوباسيفايز ذا بالمونريس ذا اورتا اند ذا كرونريس. سو يو كان هاف ا تريب رول اوت. يو كان اكسكلود كرونري ارتي ديزيز اورتيك ديسكشن اند بالمونري امبوليزم ان ا سينجل تيست. So it is very nice. So it's a, we do a CT angiogram and we get all the data we need. We excluded the most important three life-threatening causes of acute chest pain. The problem, there are a lot of studies on this, and the problem that triple rule out did not go very well into clinical practice is again the commonality. Remember when I told you that most cases of chest pain in the emergency room are actually non-specific causes. So it's a very good test when you use it with clinical suspicion. But it is not routine. Because if you do routine CT angiography in this particular protocol that uses a lot of contrast for everybody coming with chest pain in the ER, this is definitely not cost effective. And again, you are giving a lot of radiation and contrast material to patients that are definitely not suspect. So the decision pathway is this. You do history taking, proper history taking, proper clinical examination and ECG and cardiac troponin. And then if you are suspecting from the history and the examination, there's an aortic dissection, you can go this way. But this is not a routine thing to do. Because of aortic dissection, you can see it very easily in CT angiography. But as a percentage of the number of cases coming to the ER with aortic dissection, it happens in high flow or high volume centers once every month. So it is not really basically cost effective or even reasonable to do a CT angiogram for the 30 patients that come with acute chest pain in the ER every day to detect an aortic dissection that comes once every month. So this is basically it. I leave you with chest pain. So any questions? Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> بس هو نفس صح بالظبط ده نومن كليتش بالظبط نفس الفكره وشكل التشيست بين عامل ازاي الكلام هو هو هم اللي غيروه النومن كليتش عشان تاني لما انا اقول لسيادتك اتيبيكال حتى في الطب بتستخدم كده اتيبيكال برزنتيشن اوف نقط ات مينز ات از نقط بس كومينج ويز اتيبيكال برزنتيشن سو وين اي ام سينج اتيبيكال تشيست بين you not get, get really the impression that this is not cardiac chest pain. It is cardiac, but it's coming with a different or a typical presentation. That's why it is cardiac, probably cardiac. This is the atypical of before or non-cardiac. So this is how we, we, we categorize the different uh, presentation of chest pain. Tamim. Uh, sure. Uh, 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 Stress yeah. echo, stress uh, CMR, stress MPI. Stress is class 2A. Well, again, the availability. I mean, I mean, not all the places you can find available in the same day or the same day for stress. The stress test is actually much more available. But it's class 2A. And I'm saying the low sensitivity is specific. Okay, the ASC guidelines can be more intermediate for them. They can be more intermediate to go for CT coronary angio. We can go for stress test imaging. هو بالظبط بس هو كاتب يعني بس الايج مش مش عارف بقيه الحاجات لا بص هو العظمه دي هو بتاع الكبير ده اللي انت لازم تعرف ورا عمل براير تيستنج ولا لا ده بيحدد لك لو براير تيستنج في خلال فتره قريبه وكان بيطلع حاجه مهمه جو فور انفيزيف انجو على طول ما كانتش حاجه مهمه انكونكلوسيف سي تي انجو لو كان قريب قوي نيجاتيف في خلال سنه ستريس ستريس كان نيجاتيف او خلال سنتين سي تي او برايمري انجل انت بتشارج روح ولو سي تي انجل هتمشي في الاجول بتاعها اللي هو بيزك اللي هو هو لو ما كانش في برايمري تيستنج نفس القصه هم الاثنين كلاس 1 بقى ما بقوش كلاس 2 
ده عيان جاي باكيوت تشيست بين خدت هيستوري وكلينيكال اكزامينيشن اي سي جي وطلعت السكور بتاعك الكلينيكال ديسيجن بتاعك قال لك ان هو انترميديت وما كانش عامل حاجه للقلب قبل كده انت هتختار ستريس تيست ولا سي تي ان اكوردنج ايه الاكسبرتيز الموجود الايج لو اكتر من 65 لو العيان مثلا ابتدائي بتاعه عالي اكيد هتروح ناحيه الستريس تيست لو بتدور على سكين اكتر وهكذا يعني انت اختيار بس الاثنين ما حدش يقدر ان انت غلط الالجوريزم واضح وصريح الاثنين تراكس موجودين الاثنين كلاس 1 وبالمناسبه الاثنين بيرجعوا لبعض لو طلع ده انكونكلوسيف اعمل ستريس تيست لو طلع ده انكونكلوسيف روح اعمل سي تي انش وهم دي ار نوت كومبيتيتف هم بيكملوا بعض نفس المعنى تمام اشكرك شكرا جزيلا اقفل بقى حاجاتك